I would like to welcome you to the workshop series titled God's Financial Wisdom for Young People. The presenter, Tom Copeland, is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ who has been called to teach God's Word on finances since 1982. Tom has helped thousands of people learn and apply God's financial principles. Tom is the founder and president of Copeland Financial Ministries, and his financial moments are aired on numerous radio and TV stations. Now, here's Tom teaching God's financial wisdom for young people. I'd like to welcome you to this series titled God's Financial Wisdom for Young People. Although the biblical principles taught in this series can benefit anyone of any age, the practical application, including the real-life case studies, will be focused on the financial challenges that young people face. By young people, generally I'm referring to people between 15 and 29 years of age. So this is session six of eight sessions on the topic of God's Financial Wisdom for Young People. And in this particular session, it's focused on God's promises and our stewardship responsibilities. Again, God's promises and our stewardship responsibilities. So here's a question. What is your understanding of Christian or biblical stewardship? So what's your understanding of biblical stewardship? What do you think? I find this. Most Christians would just think about tithing. And they think that's what stewardship's all about. But as you're going to see as we go through this session, biblical stewardship is a lot more than just tithing. Let's review some scriptures together. Here's the first one. Psalms 24, 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And in 1 Chronicle 29, David praised God with these words, Everything in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. Who owns the money? Haggai 2, 8 answers, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. And we have to remember at that time when uh, this scripture was written, silver and gold was used as money. So God's saying the money is his. You may say to yourself, but wait a second, I've worked hard and used my skills and abilities to earn a good income. But here's the next question. Who gave you your skills and abilities? Deuteronomy chapter 8 says, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. It is God who gives us all our natural abilities, and he gives us the ability to earn a good income, a high income, and to produce wealth. Is there anything that God does not own? God said to Job, and who has any claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven, everything under heaven, God said, belongs to me, Job 41.11. So here's my definition of Christian stewardship, or you could say biblical stewardship. I think the key biblical principle is this. We are stewards or managers of the money that God has entrusted to us. God is the owner. Everyone is accountable to God, even if you do not have a lot of income. Romans 14, 12 states, So then each of us will give account of himself to God. And if you think you own the money and material things you have, wait until a split second after you die. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul said, We brought nothing into this world, we shall take nothing out of it. Now I know as a young person you may think you're going to live forever, but we don't know that. And it's a good time when you're young to start learning about God's word on finances. So more specifically, I'd say Christian or biblical stewardship is acknowledging in your mind and heart that God owns absolutely everything. He owns your money, your smartphone, your car if you have one, your skills, and even your life, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And secondly, use all the assets that God's entrusted to you in accordance with God's principles and God's specific will. So as a practical matter, how do we fulfill our stewardship responsibilities? Think about that, Miss. How do we fulfill our stewardship responsibilities? whether you're young or middle-aged or older. Here's um, the three key items, I would say. On a regular basis, spend quality time with the Lord in prayer, asking God for His wisdom and His direction, and managing the money that God has entrusted to you. In James 1, 5, and 6, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, and we all lack wisdom, we don't know the future, we don't know what the best financial decision is, because often uh, it depends on future events as well. But it's, the Scripture says, If any of you lack wisdom, we all lack wisdom, we don't have God's wisdom. He should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Secondly, study and meditate on God's word with respect to finances regularly. In Joshua 1, 8, it says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. And number three, trust God to provide your needs and direct you according to his will. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he, that is God, will direct your paths. And as you fulfill your stewardship responsibilities, what are some of God's promises? Think about what are the Lord's, some of the Lord's promises? Here's, uh, here's two of them. In Matthew 6, 31 to 33, Jesus said, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Notice, you put God first. God has promised to meet your needs, but not necessarily your wants and desires. I, I've seen over the years, as I've counseled thousands of young people, and people of all ages, that most people, including young people, spend money on things that they really don't need. We'll talk about that further in a minute. And in Psalms 32.8, the second thing that God promised is that he would direct us. Psalms 32.8, God said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. What a promise from the Lord that he's, he's promised to guide and direct us. If you look at Psalms 25.12, it says, Who then is the man who fears the Lord? God will instruct him in the way chosen for him. And of course, that applies to men and women. Here's some examples where young people need to discern God's specific will before they make a financial decision, a key decision. First of all, which university or college should, should you attend? Or perhaps you should go into one of the trades, electrician, carpenter, plumber. Um, nothing wrong with going to one of the trades. Actually, in our country, there's actually a shortage of tradespeople. So it's, it's good to consider that if that's God's will for you. But which university or college should you, you, you attend or trade school or whatever, that's where you need to pray and discern God's will. Secondly, should you live out of town or should you stay at home with your parents? Big difference in the cost, whether you live out of town or you stay home, stay home with your parents. Thirdly, should you purchase a car? Um, some young people go out and purchase a car, arguing that they need it, and often they really can't afford it. So you have to assess. That involves uh, preparing a budget, and we'll talk about that uh, later. And Actually, there's a whole section on budgeting in this series. Um, can you really afford to purchase a car? Not only, I mean, if you have the cash, that's great, and that's the best way to go, but can you afford the loan payments, and then can you afford the insurance, the repairs and maintenance, um, the gas and oil? It, uh, having a car is, is really can be quite expensive. And the uh, next point is you need to discern God's will bef and get God's wisdom before and in the process of developing and implementing a budget. Um, you need to do that and discern God's will with respect to lifestyle. Uh, often I find young people, are, they're, they're living a lifestyle that's not realistic and they're doing it on credit cards and lines of credit and they're buying a lot of things and spending money that they really don't need to spend and uh, it's amazing how much uh, the credit card companies will lend to young people they have no assets no job no income at all uh, but they'll still give them credit cards as you know they show up to the colleges and universities uh, quite regularly to hand out the credit cards and so young people have to be really careful about that um, I will also say this, when you try to discern God's direction, God will often speak to us through his word. In Psalms 119, 105, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. In other words, as you read scripture, you can read a hundred scriptures and God through his Holy Spirit, if you've accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. God through his Holy Spirit can highlight certain scriptures and, and God can speak to us through his word. That's the most common way he speaks to uh, to by far the majority of Christians is through his word. So you want to get into God's word regularly. So the conclusion of this part of the session is this. If you acknowledge that God owns everything, and if you faithfully use money and material things in accordance with God's word and God's will, then you can completely trust God to meet your needs and direct your financial decisions. We can absolutely trust the Lord if we do things God's way. I'm a real strong believer in getting into God's Word because God often speaks to us through His Word. I mean, Hebrews 4.12 says, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God's Word is powerful. And I, each session, I encourage you to uh, meditate upon some scriptures I call them memory verses. And here's the first one in 1 Chronicles 29. That's where David said, Everything in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as being in control of everything. Riches and honor come from you alone, and you are the ruler of all mankind. Your hand controls power and might, and it is at your discretion that men are made great and given strength. And the second verse I'd, I'd encourage you to meditate upon. It's really simple. You can probably memorize it very quickly. It's Haggai 2.8, where it says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Remember, silver and gold were used as money then? God's saying the money is his. I'd like to now go through a, a case study. 
Uh, the names, of course, with all my case studies have been selected at random, but the facts of the case study, uh, case studies that I give, both in this, this series and all the series that I do, are real-life situations. They're practical real-life situations that I've seen many, many times. And so here's, a, and often people, when they, they watch the show, they can see themselves in some of these case studies. So here's the first case study. Bob and Joshua are Christian friends. They are both currently attending university. They both have full-time jobs during the summer and part-time jobs during the school year. Bob feels that he's worked hard for his money and therefore he has the right to spend it as he wishes. Bob, Bob uses credit cards and his student line of credit quite read, readily, often to purchase things that he does not need. Bob has already accumulated significant debts and often he does not, he's not able to meet his financial obligations on time. Bob has no savings, so when an unexpected necessary expenditure arises, he is forced into debt. Bob is now feeling stressed out as he's maxed out his line of credit and his credit cards, but he still has two years of university to complete. Bob is trying to get additional line of credit and another credit card in order to finance his expenses. Bob generally gives almost nothing to God's work. He feels that this is reasonable because he's a student and he cannot afford to give anything. Joshua, on the other hand, had previously attended a biblical financial study at his church. He learned that he was a steward of the money that God had entrusted to him, and therefore he needed to manage money according to biblical financial principles and God's specific will. As a result, at the beginning of each year, Joshua prepares a budget of anticipated necessary expenses that he will incur during the year, and then he ensures that he earns enough to cover those expenses with a cushion. In other words, he makes sure that his, earnings, his projected earnings are greater than his expenses, and uh, he also works full-time during the summer and part-time during the school year. Joshua generally only spends money on needs and not wants and desires. He is not concerned that his fellow students eat out regularly, take rather nice vacations, have better smartphones, or wear designer clothes. Joshua is content with the lifestyle he is living. He decided not to purchase a car, but rather use public transit to save money. Joshua gives to God's work regularly, and actually quite generously in light of his income. Joshua uses a credit card very carefully and he pays it off each month and incurs no interest charges. Joshua has developed a reasonable level of savings so when an unexpected expenditure arises he is not forced into debt. Joshua anticipates he'll be able to complete his post-secondary education with no debt and has some savings which he will use to purchase a used car for cash after he gets his first full-time job. So here's the first question to think about. The first fellow we talked about, Bob, uh, has he practiced biblical stewardship? In other words, has Bob acknowledged in his mind and heart that God owns everything? And is Bob managing money in accordance with God's principles and God's will? And if you remember, Bob's the guy that was spending money very freely, freely accumulating a lot of debt, and got into a, some financial difficulty, actually. So what do you think? Is he practicing biblical stewardship? The answer is clearly no. Bob is not acknowledged in his heart and mind that God owns everything um, and so he's managing money the world's way as opposed to God's way. Bob believes that he's the owner and therefore it is his right to spend money as he wishes often on selfish desires. He buys a lot of things he doesn't need. Bob is violating God's financial principles by spending more than he earns and accumulating debt. Bob is a bad testimony to his creditors as he does not pay his bills on time. So more specifically, think about this. What biblical financial principles has Bob violated? And if you can, provide a reference to Scripture for each point. So what biblical principles, specific ones, has Bob violated? Here's, um, I had several. Bob has no financial plan. He has no budget. In Luke chapter 14, parable of the tower, Christ admonished us to plan ahead. Bob's just flying by the seat of his pants and buying what he wants. He's just operating on guesswork, really. Bob has too much debt, and Proverbs 22.7 warns that we can become a servant to the lender. Bob is very selfish. Um, Philippians uh, chapter 2 tells us that we should not be selfish, but uh, consider others' needs. And one demonstration that he's selfish is that he spends a lot of money on wants and desires and not needs. Bob's focus is really on material things, as treasures on earth, rather than things of eternal value, such as treasures in heaven. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, do not build up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but build up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the fifth point, Bob spends all of his income and has no savings. So when an unexpected expenditure comes along, 
he's forced into debt. And Proverbs 21.20 says, In the house of the wise there is a storage of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. And Bob falls into the foolish category. Further, Bob believes he's an owner and not a steward of the money and material things that he's uh, been entrusted to. And that's why he's managing money the world's way. And number seven, Bob does not make any reasonable effort to give something to God's work. The tither we talked about in the previous sessions, a guideline, it's not a legalism. But he doesn't make any effort to give anything to God's work. And so his excuse that he's a, he's a student is not acceptable to God. God directed us. Remember even in Luke chapter 21, the parable of the widow? She had, um, she had almost no income. And she, she still gave to God's work. Uh, she gave sacrificially. And certainly young people, students even, can give something to the Lord's work. It may not be 10%, but give whatever the Lord's directed you to do. But don't, don't uh, ignore it completely. So here's a question. The other fellow, Joshua, has he practiced biblical stewardship? In other words, has Joshua acknowledged in his mind and his heart that God owns everything? And is he managing money in accordance with God's principles and God's will? What do you think about that? I think the answer on this one is clearly yes. Joshua has acknowledged in his heart and mind that God owns everything. He's managing money according to biblical financial principles. No question about that. So here's the, um, the more important question here. What specific Biblical financial principles is Joshua following. Provide a reference to scripture for each point. Okay, what specific uh, uh, principles is he, is he following? And you know you've identified the principle if you can provide a reference to scripture. I had, uh, I had 10 of them. And here's what they are. The first thing is Joshua is developing and following a budget. Remember the beginning of each year he developed a budget on the projected expenses for the next year, tuition fees, books, uh, transit, etc., etc., and then he'd also prepare a budget and determine, okay, how much do I need to earn in order to pay for all these bills? And, and he had a cushion within his, within his cash flow, Proverbs 2120, which is biblical. And it's a wise thing to do because you never know if some unexpected expenditures will come along. And of course, as I mentioned earlier in the parable of the tower, Christ admonished us to plan ahead. And so even young people need to plan each year. I say even start planning even several years before you start going to uh, post-secondary school and start saving up even when you're in high school. Why not? Uh, I gave an example of that in an earlier uh, session, a, a, a real-life case study of that. Be sure to check that out. Uh, by the way, the other sessions are on our web, website, copelandfinancialministries.org, so you can access them at any time. The second thing um, that Bob did in following biblical financial principles, he avoided debt by paying off his credit cards each month. Proverbs 22.7 encourages us to minimize debt. Thirdly, he developed some savings, which is biblical. Uh, God wants us to have some savings. Fourth, he, gives, he gave generously to God's work. We don't know if it was a tithe or not. The tithe is a guideline, but we know he gave generously in light of his income, and that's what counts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And um, God loves a cheerful giver, and uh, God is uh, also going to bless uh, Joshua even further because of his generosity. Number five, paying his bills on time. Romans 13, 8 says, let no debt remain outstanding. So by paying his bills on time, he's following that biblical principle in Romans 13, 8. But he's also, um, he's got credibility with his, his uh, creditors, the people that have loaned him money, or the credit card companies. Well, the other fellow, Bob, he doesn't because he's not paying his liabilities on time. Number six, Joshua acknowledges that he's a steward and not an owner of the money and material things that God's entrusted to him. 1 Corinthians 4.2 said that it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. In other words, if you have any money at all, you've been given a trust. If you have any time, you have any talents, you've been given a trust. We need to be faithful. Faithfulness to God is the key. Number seven, Joshua is content with a lifestyle that is less than the income that God has provided to him demonstrated by the fact that he has some savings. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul said, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, we shall take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Number eight, God puts his Lord, he puts God first in managing money, and as a result, God has met his needs. And remember in Matthew chapter 6, Christ promised to meet our needs as we put him first, not necessarily our wants and desires. Now a lot of his uh, fellow young Young people were spending a lot of money like Bob on wants and desires, but God's promised to meet our needs as we put him first, but not necessarily the wants and desires. So you've you got to make a distinction there. The next point, Joshua 
has no issue with covetousness as his fellow students have more things. When he saw his fellow students, uh, some of them uh, had designer clothes, some of them had a new smartphone, some of them were taking nice vacations, uh, they were eating out often, this kind of stuff. That didn't bother Joshua. Uh, some of them even owned uh, some nice cars. That didn't bother him at all. He just focused on God and doing what God wanted him to do. In other words, his focus was on things of eternal value, not the temporal. And I think uh, one of the key points is Joshua has learned and applied God's financial principles. So when he goes to heaven, Joshua is going to hear the words that we all want to hear when we get to heaven, where God says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. That's in Matthew 25, 23. Next question. Let's suppose Bob became open to learning God's way of managing money. This is a fellow who was spending, 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 accumulating debt and getting in all kinds of trouble. Let's suppose he came, became open to learning God's way of managing money. What biblically based uh, advice would you give to Bob and provide a reference to scripture for each point? And again, if you can provide a reference, you know you're giving him biblically based financial advice. So I, I think there's no substitute for knowing God's word on finances uh, quite thoroughly, actually. Then, then you can not only manage money, better and uh, more accurately God's way, and you can give biblically-based financial advice to your friends and family members. So what specific uh, advice would we, which should you give to Bob? I think first, Bob needs to understand that he's a steward and not an owner of the money that God's entrusted to him. Haggai 2.8, 1 Chronicles 29. Uh, he needs to understand that it's not his money. He can't uh, do with it whatever he wants to. He's just managing what God's entrusted to him, his money, his talents, and even his time here on earth. The second thing is Bob must recognize that he's been violating many biblical financial principles and that he needs to learn God's way of managing money. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be fully equipped to do every good work. And that part of that equipping is managing money according to biblical principles. Number four, Bob needs to develop and implement a budget as Christ admonished us to do in Luke chapter 14, to ensure that he's spending less than he earns so he has a surplus to pay down debt and save for future needs. That's the key. He's got to basically develop a budget, implement it in such a way that he's spending less than he earns, and he's got a surplus each month to pay down debt and save for future needs. Otherwise, he's going to just keep accumulating debt and get, and get further into trouble. And number five, he needs to avoid using debt. Proverbs 22.7 warns of the dangers of debt. Bob needs to, to avoid using debt. I'd say this, Bob needs to develop some savings, Proverbs 21 and 20. He needs to have a cushion of cash to fall back on. Everyone needs that because we can all have some unexpected expenditures. And I would say Bob needs to meditate upon God's words, some key scriptures. Uh, some of them are listed out in this session in order to change the way he thinks about and manages money. Romans 12, 2 says that um, it says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And how do you renew your mind? Joshua 1.8 gives the answers. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Uh, Bob needs to get into God's Word, particularly in the areas he struggles with, which is a lot of areas. And he needs to um, meditate on those scriptures and allow God, through his Word and his Spirit, to change the way he thinks about and manages money. I, I would encourage Bob and I would encourage everyone, if you're listening, to go to our website, copelandfinancialministries.org. There's lots of information on there in general. There's actually seven other sessions that are specific to God's financial wisdom for young people. Um, you can watch the other sessions uh, for free. You can even check out our online interactive uh, video uh, under the title, Financial Management God's Way. And by the way, that's one thing, one video and one series. You could, it's quite easy to lead a small group. So I'd encourage you even to consider leading a small group at your church. In addition, there's other resources. For example, um, the Excel-based uh, budgeting system, the Copeland uh, system. It's Excel-based. You can download it for free. There's a 30-minute video there on how to use it and how to develop and implement a budget. This applies to all ages, whether you're young or middle-aged or older. Uh, everyone needs to have some form of a budget. Most of the resources are free. There's, I think, um, almost 300 financial moments on audio and almost 200 on video. There's all kinds of resources. And most of them are free. And there's just so much wisdom in God's word on finances. And for young people, I, I can't overly stress that the best time to learn how to manage money is when you're young. 
so you don't make all the mistakes that so many people make. I get so many cases where couples come to me and they're, say, middle-aged and they're up to their eyeballs in debt and the husband and wife are just fighting and arguing over finances and they're under so much stress. I've seen so many marriages break up because one spouse, um, or maybe both, manage money the world's way instead of God's way. I've seen so many cases uh, where this has happened and, and it's, it, it can all be avoided if God's people learn God's way of managing money It'll make a huge difference on, on, on the rest of your life. It, it can make a mammoth difference. It can even imp impact whether you get a job or not because more employers now are doing credit checks um, before they hire somebody. It can impact uh, your future relationship, your future, future marriage. Uh, so many things. And it's best to learn it while you're young because so often when people leave it and leave it and leave it and they learn it later, it's not that they can't learn it, learn it when they're middle-aged or older, but the problem is by then they've often accumulated a huge amount of debt and it makes it that much harder uh, to get out of debt. So um, I just encourage you to take this opportunity when you're young to study what the Bible says on finances. And uh, as Jesus said in John 8.32 to his disciples, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. God's truth in his word can set you free from the deceptions in this world. And I'll be talking about that in the next session about uh, some of the financial deceptions that young people le uh, believe. Uh, which causes them to get into a, a lot of financial difficulty. I'd like to now uh, close in prayer. Father, I just pray that every single person who's listening to this show, that you would touch their hearts and their minds. We know your word is powerful. It's truth, Lord. And we know, as it says in Isaiah 55, 11, that your word would not come back empty, but accomplish what you desire and fulfill the purpose for which you sent it. And Father, I pray that through your word and your spirit, you would touch the hearts of everyone listening and that you would encourage them, Lord, um, and prompt them through your Holy Spirit to really get and in, dig into your word on finances, learn the biblical financial principles, apply them, and certainly follow up. Uh, as James said, do not merely listen to the word and so you deceive yourselves, do what it says. Encourage them, Lord, to follow up uh, and to pray regularly as well and ask you to guide and direct them to the rights of the scriptures the proper scriptures to, uh, to give them your wisdom and your specific direction as you so often will do. Again, I think of your word in Psalms 119, 105 where you said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. That's, uh, the psalmist said that your word, Lord, is a light um, to our feet and a lamp to our path. And we thank you for your word, for your wisdom in the area of finances. And we just pray that you would guide and direct every single person that's listening to this show today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to learn more about God's Word on finances, be sure to check out the numerous resources available at copelandfinancialministries.org or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter under Bible Finance. 